Hey guys, KYT here. I'm back after a much deserved break. In this video, we are going to be tackling the concept of compounding. This is inspired by many questions I've seen recently on different platforms where the concept of compounding interest makes sense, but it's confusing how that applies to something that gives little to no yield and often leads to questions like, why are you an XQT if it only gives 2% yield? Compounding is a financial concept where the value of your investment grows at an increasing rate. So instead of something like a linear growth, like this graph, it grows exponentially. One of the simplest investment vehicles to understand compounding interest are GICs. Of course, we're going to have to make a few assumptions. Here we are on Tangerine. It says up to 4.65%, but for the sake of this video, let's just assume a 4.65%. Now you can take any compound interest calculator that you can find on Google to try to visualize the power of compounding. So we're just gonna put some numbers here, initial investment, $1,000. We contribute nothing extra. We have $1,000 invested for 35 years and the interest rate is 4.65%, like we said. Interest rate variance range, zero, which is not realistic. Obviously the interest rate will change throughout 35 years, but for the sake of just illustrating the concept, we're gonna say zero compound frequency annually. And if we calculate, we can see this sort of small bend upwards, which you know, at the end of the day, the power of compounding, the concept is very simple. You invest some money, you get interest, but then the future interest is now applied to the original $1,000 plus the initial, like the first year of interest. So each time the percentage is applied to a bigger amount, so you're getting more interest every year and every subsequent year. So it really is like a snowball that builds into an avalanche. And from this, this is where you hear a lot of beginner advice that you should invest a lot and you should invest early for the impact of compounding to be even more pronounced. So if we scroll back up and if we just add 100 to the monthly contribution here, you'll notice that the graph here is even sharper. So you get to benefit more and more the earlier and the more you invest at, at the initial time period. Now, the concept of compounding is even simpler to understand with GICs and HISAs because it is guaranteed compounding. The principle never diminishes in value. If we go back to my total return formula, these GICs, HISAs don't really have to care about capital appreciation, dividend yield, or other income yield. It is mainly interest yield, and the total return will always be positive. Now, if we shift to stocks and ETFs like VFV, I can now understand why a beginner that started learning about compound interest can get confused. Because in the world of GICs, HISAs, you invest, you get paid regularly, and your amount of money keeps going up. Here, it's like with VFV, it's like, who, who's paying you? Like, what's going on? How are you getting more and more money? Why do you hear compounding with VFV as well? First of all, compounding is not guaranteed with stocks, whether they're dividend stocks or growth stocks. Even if they pay a lot of yield, compounding does not necessarily happen, and we'll get into dividend and yield more a bit later. Second of all, you have to look at both types of investments completely differently. For Jesse's, you can imagine yourself sort of lending money to the bank, and they're paying you interest for that loan. Here, when it comes to VFV, you're investing in companies and you're hoping for your investment success that these companies become more valuable over time. So completely different. One, you're sort of lending money. The other one, you're relying on companies to become more and more valuable, which may or may not happen. And the natural question is like, why bother investing in stocks if it's just riskier than that safe 4.65% that we saw earlier? And that's because with more risk usually comes with higher expected return. Basically, across infinite future universes, on average, if you invested in stocks, you would make more than 4.65%. If you scroll down the VFB page, there's a section that summarizes the annualized return across different ranges. So here we've got over 10 years, it's returned 15.29%. So it's as if the interest rate, you invested $1,000, let's say, and the interest rate was 15.29% for 10 years. So I've had a conversation with someone recently where they said that people should be wary of using compound interest calculator for things like VFV. And I can see their point because they are right. It's not actually compound interest. You're not getting paid interest like a GIC or HISA, but it is still a 
tool to use for people that want to project how much they would have made or will make given an annualized rate of return. So what I mean is if you plug in a thousand dollars here, 10 years, instead of interest rate, right? You would put what you think the annualized rate of return could be here. We saw 15.29 to then see what that a thousand dollars would amount to. So you're not using the precise terms, like how it's meant to be used as it's precisely described, but this is something that you can use to put annualized rate of return to project the future earnings and, and stuff of your portfolio if you want to do that. Me, I don't do this because I don't want to assume future uh, percentage returns, so it's not really of great interest to me, but I can see why someone might want to do this. I'm going to wrap this up with a touch on dividends. Here we have BCE, which is Bell, popular dividend stock, popular company that has been around for a while. And despite it being a dividend stock, dividend company, and giving out dividends, it has a negative return since the beginning of 2022. Now, people who hype up dividend snowball as a strategy and how it helps you compound or technically right on one dimension of the strategy, which is you are getting more and more shares. This is very similar to the GIC example, except instead of money, it's number of shares. So you have 100 shares, let's say, and you're given shares every few months based on the amount of shares you have initially. And because that amount of shares keeps growing, the number of shares you have, assuming that the company keeps giving out consistent dividends will keep on growing. So you'll have exponentially more shares. And the yield for Bell has been pretty high. It's been around eight to 9% for the last few years. But yet, despite that, it has a negative return because unlike a GIC where your principal is safe, here the principal, if you will, is tied to the value of the company. And if that doesn't do well, of course, it doesn't really matter how many shares that you have. It's possible for you to lose money versus in a GIC or in an HISA. Now, to be clear, I'm just showing this example to clarify a common misunderstanding that I think a lot of beginners normally have. They'll often ask why something with 12 to 15% yield is a bad investment when, well, if it's a GIC with 12 to 15% interest, then it's an excellent, then I'd probably put a lot of money into that. But because it's something with 12 to 15% yield, it's just a portion of the overall picture. It's you still need to know what you think about the capital appreciation of that company or ETF moving forward. And so it's not guaranteed like a GIC, like an HISA. And you can definitely overestimate your return in these vehicles. To summarize, there is guaranteed compounding when it comes to GICs and HISAs. Once you move out of that world, it is no longer guaranteed and your best if you don't understand that concept your best to understand the why the math behind that concept and with that i'll see you in the next one